So I don't think anything I'm going to say will surprise anyone, particularly after the two other excellent uh, talks you've heard. Um, but I think we should ask more, at more length the question of why, what good history of science and humanities is. Now, this room is full of people who already think that this is an important subject, so we don't need to be preaching to each other about how important the subject is. But when we go out there facing the public, facing the students, um, I think we do need to ask this question, and particularly with the young students. They may well ask, and they often do ask, what is the point of history? And it's not just an idle question, because to them, it seems that the modern world is so very different, even from the world in which we, uh, others of their teachers, grew up in. So to them, it seems that what happened even in the 1970s, 80s is irrelevant in terms of how they're going to navigate in this very new, familiar world that seems unique to them. And this, they would think, is especially the case concerning science and technology. I mean, what good is it for the science student, engineering student of today to learn what Simone Stevin and others have done many, many years ago? And it's not good enough, I think, to give the usual answer that we can learn lessons from history. Because that only works if the past is anything like the future. The lessons that our predecessors must, should have learned back then may not be applicable anymore, especially when we're dealing with such complex and new situations. So uh, there are two things I'd like to do today in this uh, relatively brief presentation. One is to give you some sense of my own practice uh, in history of science and um, to try to link that up with some other themes that have been discussed. But the other is to discuss more generally why anybody should want to learn history of science and humanities. I might just say history of knowledge. Right. We used to say history of ideas, but it's so much more than just ideas. And my general message is, again, going to be not surprising to um, those of you who've heard what has been said in the last half hour. It's going to be a kind of historiographical pluralism, which um, is committed to a tolerance of various approaches and methods and goals, respect for each other and uh, active interaction between those different strands of what we call history of science and humanities. And I think it is particularly fitting for that to be happening in Amsterdam and in the Netherlands in general. I, if I may presume to comment on what you are like. <laughs> this is, after all, the city that took in everyone from Fahrenheit to Descartes. This is the city uh, which I think thrives on tolerance and the inclusion of difference and the acceptance and cultivation of outsiders, may I say. I think it says something about your common collective character that to this great event you invite a keynote speaker who is a complete outsider to you and have the whole thing in English and I may note that I'm a, um, I'm a foreigner in a triple sense. Because I come from Britain now, I'm American by official nationality and higher education, and I'm Korean by birth and upbringing. And there's nothing at all Dutch about my background yet. I have always, always felt completely welcome and uh, alive here whenever I come to the Netherlands. Let's ask um, why we do history. I think this is a question that we have to face in general terms at least every so often. We can't obsess about this every day because then we'd get no work done. But I think on occasions like this we have to ask, and I want to ask the question in a general way. Because history of science and humanities, after all, is history. So we, we need to ask why do we do history at all, and then try to see how those thoughts apply to our particular type of history. 
And I say that in a very conscious way because, um, as you may have guessed, my training was first in physics and then in philosophy. History I picked up later in life. I hold no degrees in history of any kind, but I've now become a historian, so that's quite a strange feeling. But um, I think we do need to ask, why do we do history? Because that, to me, certainly was not obvious. Um, Henk has mentioned my work on the history of chemistry. When I teach that subject, I tell my students there were two things that I absolutely hated when I was a student. One was chemistry and the other was history. So, <laughs> as punishment, I now work in history of chemistry. So in very general terms, what may we want to achieve or derive from history? And I put up five very general answers. We want to describe what happened in the past. We want to understand it. We often want to make use of the past. And then there are two other more unusual things for historians to say. One is that we want to overcome the past that shapes us. And the final bit, I say, we want to revive and appreciate the past. Now, I'm going to go through these things in a slight bit more detail, but the first two items there, I think, are both obvious and too profound for me to say very much about. So, of course, we want to describe the past, we want to know what happened, but why? This is a very difficult question to answer, actually, when you encounter the student or member of the public who says, it's not interesting. We say, isn't it so interesting and that so-and-so did such and such? And they say, no. <laughs> and then it's very, very difficult to come back to that if they're simply not interested. And I think we do need to do it. And then we, of course, as historians say, we want to understand the past. It's nice to say, but what does that mean? And here I think we have to defer to Hank again, because his business is to talk about what scientific understanding means. So now we have to ask you about historical understanding as well. But it's not an easy question. I have neither the time nor the right answers to give. But I think what these two items I put up there summarize is the idea of doing history for its own sake because historical knowledge is valuable, but that needs to be justified. Having said that, let me move on to um, the third item on my list, which is really the main thing I want to talk about. History is not just knowledge for its own sake. Right? History is very, very useful but in exactly what ways, and there are many, many ways. And the first thing, now particularly thinking about history of knowledge, I think is that quite often we look to the history for inspiration as a source of these ideals, models, heroes sometimes, that we want to emulate. And this doesn't mean that we assume that the past is like the future, it means that from the past we derive normative ideals. And here I think it is apt to look back at one of the founders of the field of history of science, looking across the Belgian border to George Sarto. Um, this passage I've given here comes from the introduction to his uh, masterwork, which he called the introduction to the history of science. Some of you may uh, actually know the content of it. And it, this, was, this was published in 1927, the, when he started publishing those volumes, and he explains why he bothers with it. And he says, the purpose of this work is to explain briefly the development of one essential phase of human civilization, which has not yet received sufficient attention, the development of science. So we can recall the time when there was no history of science as an established academic discipline and Sarton trying to make one. By the way, what he means by briefly here is uh, about that much, which he never finished, right? He got to, I think, the 13th century and died. And I, I don't know how long this work would have been if he had 
had a chance to finish. But here he goes on to explain um, that science is this very valuable part of civilization that historians usually neglect. And then he says this very striking thing. The acquisition and systematization of positive knowledge, in other words, science, is the only human activity which is truly cumulative and progressive. I mean, that, that's quite a strong statement. Many of us now would not agree with that, but I think what this shows is that Sartan at least had a clear notion of why he was doing history of science. It was to exhibit the best form of rationality that humans had come up with so that we could emulate it. Now, if we reject that vision from Saturn, I think it is our responsibility to come up with a different vision that we may follow. And here I've given you lots of different uses of, of history of science. Um, most of these are quite obvious points when you think about them. There are just two things I want to mention. One is this item where I say we can use the history of science to excite and exhort, inspire our peers and students. And I have a parenthetical note there saying, for this purpose, Whig history can be actually very useful. Now, I, I assume some of you at least know the reference to that. For those of you who don't, Whig is as in the Whigs and Tories of British politics, and Herbert Butterfield um, accused certain other historians of British politics uh, and said, well, you guys write history as if you, the Whigs, are the culmination of human history, and everything is just a progressive step leading to you. And he said there's much of history of science that's written like this, um, as if every development in the history of science were to, meant to lead to the present. Now, of course, we condemn this kind of history as inaccurate, as short-sighted, as um, all kinds of things. I have colleagues who actually mark students down if they write Whiggish essays, and I, I have big arguments with them about that. But the point I'd like to make here is that this all depends on your purpose. If your purpose is to inspire your students to become great scientists, then it makes all the sense in the world to write history like the Whigs. If that is not your purpose, then of course other methods are more useful. Now, the last point, the, the other uh, point here on this list I want to stress is the, the one that I put in blue here, where I say to stimulate critical awareness and breadth. Now, I noticed in the program of the Stevin Center that um, you want to achieve a, a breadth of, of learning in all subjects that students undertake. And I think we need to question a little bit more why exactly we want students to have broad learning? Is it simply so that they know all kinds of interesting things? Yes, but I think we need to go deeper than that. And here there's a nice saying um, from the British novelist L.P. Hartley who said the past is a foreign country. They do things differently there. So I think the study of history is broadening in the same way as people have always said, traveling is broadening. And this, the point is that we can give students a level of critical awareness about their own subject. If they know that the same subject used to be done very differently, that's the best shortcut I find uh, to letting them realize that it doesn't always have to be done in the same way. And that goes also with the saying that, oh, I'm sorry about that that history is philosophy teaching by example. Now, I don't know why that suddenly went small. <laughs> Let me just try again. That's better. But pardon me about this malfunction. 
Yes. Good. <laughs> now I just have to get back to where I was. Good. So those are the first three reasons uh, that I listed as reasons for doing history, particularly history of science. Let me come to the last two. And these will begin to get more into my own current research and my own personal reasons for doing history of science, which uh, may or may not be yours at all. Uh, so the fourth item in the list of five, I put it as we want to overcome the past. And this may sound quite strange, especially in the context of his, something like history of science. I mean, the general point, I assume, will be well taken, right? There are elements of the past which form our present and that we don't want anymore. So certainly in political history, cultural history, religious history, we may have these elements. So this is easily accepted if we are talking about Nazi Germany or any number of things from the past that still affect us. But how can you say that about science, you may say? So I've given you here a quotation from the Italian historian Croce, right, who said, only historical judgment liberates the spirit from the pressure of the past. And this is a, a, a peculiar but very valuable notion of what the mission of history is, I think. That uh, what we want to know the past for is so that we can be free. That, that we're not determined by what happened in the past. By our knowledge of the past, we can then choose to either live in the consequences of what happened in the past or not. So it's kind of a psychoanalytic intuition, if you want. But guess where I first came across this saying of Croce? It was from Thomas Kuhn. Kuhn quotes this statement in his introduction to the archive for the history of quantum physics, the set of great interviews that he and his colleagues conducted. And, and, and I never had a chance to question Kuhn while he was living, why exactly he put Croce's saying in the preface, but I thought the implication was evident. Because in quantum mechanics, um, as well as in many other sciences, there was this inheritance from the past that had become orthodoxy, namely the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics, against which people like David Bohm battled to no avail. <laughs> and the historian and physicist James Cushing has written a very nice detailed account of this uh, struggle. But the point here is that if you don't know how we ended up with the orthodoxy, then you don't know how to question it. And I think the same thing can be said um, about many, many other cases. Um, in the recent book I published about water, I have an entire chapter in which I try to explore the history of the chemical revolution from a new light. And the honest conclusion I reached then was that there was no compelling reason for chemists to abandon the phlogiston theory and adopt the Lavoisierian theory of oxygen. Now, that will sound outrageous. Uh, I just have to ask you to read the book if you think it's just nonsense, because it was not a conclusion I reached easily. But having reached it, the whole thing looked very, very different about the kind of chemistry that uh, came later, including what we have today. And the same set of questions can be raised, for example, about the victory of Einstein over people like Lorentz here, um, who I think had just as good a theory as Einstein. Now, when I say I think he did, this is clearly a personal judgment I make, not randomly and not frivolously, but on the basis of some methodological and other ideals that I subscribe to. So this is where the historian suddenly finds it impossible to deny that he himself is mixed up in the business, that, that there are judgments that we make that we are responsible for. Let me now come to 
the last of the reasons, which is even more outrageous. Now, there, there is an idea that I uh, advanced in my first book, which is that history and philosophy of science should serve the function of what I call their complementary science. The sense of which is that as science develops in a very specialized way, scientists only can deal with questions, certain questions and in certain ways. I mean, this is basically the Kuhnian idea of paradigm, right? And what I followed up with is the notion that, well, scientists, the so-called normal scientists, do need to have that kind of focus, but that doesn't mean that the questions that the normal scientists abandon or neglect are not good, worthwhile questions. So I saw it as the task of the historian and the philosopher of science to pick up those questions and ask them. And as a consequence, I began to develop this notion that historical as well as philosophical work could serve as actually a source of scientific knowledge. So that history of science is not only about science, but it actually becomes a form of science, just not as you know it. So here I, I would like to give you a few examples um, briefly to illustrate the kind of thing I mean. And I'm going to skip uh, the case of Rumford, which is very interesting, but it's a very long story. I'm going to go to the next one, which is about the boiling point of water, which you may think is a subject on which nothing more needs to be said, but I'm going to tell you otherwise. So that's the cover of my first book, on which I show this picture of a very old thermometer, and here's a better picture. It dates back to about 1760, and it's a beautiful uh, instrument made of cherry wood. It's about a meter long. It's still preserved in the Science Museum in London. Uh, unfortunately, the glass stems have broken off, so all you have is the frame. And on the frame, there are four different scales, uh, one of which is Fahrenheit here, and this is Newton and so on. But on the side of the instrument, he tells you what happens, he being uh, George Adams who made this, he tells you what happens at various temperatures. And here's a larger view so you can see. And here you see Adams gave us two boiling points. So at Fahrenheit 212, he says water boils, spelt in a strange way, vehemently. And at about 204 Fahrenheit, begins to boil. So he thought that the boiling of water happened on this large span of temperatures, roughly speaking about 5 centigrade degrees. And you look at something like this and you wonder, this guy must be an idiot. But he wasn't. First of all, he was the official instrument maker to King George III. Now, that is the mad king, but he wasn't <laughs> mad uh, when he employed Adams. Secondly, to cut a long story short, as we say, I'd like you to go home and try this out, or go to your lab, and if you watch the actual boiling of water under normal circumstances, it is precisely as Adams says here, because at very low temperatures, the bubbles begin to form. They usually don't make it through the to the surface because um, they get collapsed in coming up because the water is not hot enough and so on. It's a very, very interesting thing to watch. Uh, and you'll believe me when, I, uh, when you try it out. So what have we got here? This is a very simple instance of me, the historian, actually learning a piece of science from somebody who worked 250 years ago something that all the cutting edge modern scientific education I had never taught me. And it goes on like that. This is also about boiling. Gay-Lussac reports that um, the boiling temperature of water, pure water under normal pressure is very different depending on what kind of container you use. Again, this sounded unbelievable. I had to go and try it out and it is true. 
If you go on my website, you can see actually videos I've taken um, to show you this. And I'm going to show you just one of those videos. This is a reproduction of uh, the look from Geneva, um, an experiment he published in 1772. And what we have here is um, the boiling of water, not in the normal circumstance, which is with a flame in a big, wide open vessel. No, he said, that's not very exact because you have extremely hot temperature at the source and there's a lot of heat being lost at the surface and it all happens very fast. The bubbles form at the bottom, but we're taking the temperature of the water in the middle. That's nonsense. So he said, let's do this better. Let's heat the water very slowly without a lot of loss at the surface so that the whole body of water may come to the same temperature. And let's see what that temperature is. So this is my modern rendition of the Lux experiment. This is a hot plate, as you may use in cooking. And here's a volumetric flask, the advantage of which is that the stem is small. So there's very little heat loss happening on the surface. So now you can see what happens when you do that. Initially, nothing. That's very reassuring. And then you'll see that the water begins to boil in a very normal way. So here you see part of, yes, now it's boiling before it's 100, boiling very well, just like uh, Adams said. And then the interesting thing is the temperature, as you can see, keeps going up. And you'll also notice that there are fewer and fewer bubbles as you go on. And they get, the bubbles actually get bigger. And the temperature keeps going on. Now it's almost 102. This was a normal day under normal pressure. And you can see now the bubbles are so big that they, they tend to spill out. And then we get this very peculiar thing where nothing happens. The temperature, remember, now is 102 degrees, and it's completely still until this huge bubble comes up and goes outside. And all of this is precisely as the look reported in 1772. I was very, very impressed by that. Nothing happens. Temperature now is 104, and big bubble. I mean, you can watch this for hours. I can. <laughs> Again, a whole set of scientific facts that my modern physics education never taught me, which I learned from a text that nobody remembers uh, from 1772. The look got so fascinated by boiling. It was a book of meteorology, actually, called, um, if I may translate, uh, Modifications in the um, Atmosphere. And he was about to publish this book. Then he got worried about the accuracy of his thermometers. So he thought he should understand the boiling point better. And then he got stuck in all these complicated phenomena, ended up adding a supplement of 15 chapters to the book about boiling. <laughs> now, here's just one more example, which I think I have time to show you. Uh, this is a paper uh, that I encountered, again, in my general historical research. This is from my current project, uh, which hasn't been published. It's about the history of batteries. And here's 1806, that's six years after the invention of the battery by Volta. Right? This completely forgotten guy called Charles Sylvester in England published this paper uh, in, in the journal edited by William Nicholson, who did the first electrolysis of water himself. Anyway, Charles Sylvester, Observations and Experiments on Galvanism. And here he says, if a thin, thin coat of a solution of nitrate of silver be laid upon a piece of plain glass, and in, in the center of this be laid a bit of zinc wire, in a little time, a beautiful tree of silver will appear as if growing from the wire. You read this and you say, oh yeah, sure. <laughs> and it explains that not only zinc, but copper can do this as well. And he's right. This is the silver tree I made. 
and let me show you how it goes. So in, this is the setup. So again, my modern rendition, instead of using a glass pane, I'm using a little um, plastic envelope that can hold the photograph or something. The name tags you have at conferences work really well. So you fill that with a solution of silver nitrate, about one molar works very well. And here's a copper wire. And this is the experiment. That's all it is. You stick the copper wire into the solution and you sit back and watch. So initially this happens, everybody understands. Uh, it's a replacement reaction. Even the alchemists understood this, right? The nitric acid, in their terms, prefers copper to silver. So it had initially held silver, and when there's copper present, it takes copper instead and gives out the silver. So the copper wire gets covered in silver. Very easy to understand. But that's only if you stop watching then. If you keep watching, this happens. The silver continues to grow on the silver, and, and nobody could understand why, and it begins to take this very beautiful um, tree-like form, and that was after an hour and a half, and eventually you get that beautiful picture that I showed you at the beginning. Again, a, a very unlikely sounding thing um, that I discovered from very, very old science. So I hope uh, these two instances give you a sense of what I mean when I say you can actually use history of science to improve and supplement scientific knowledge. And th this I, I have to show you just for three seconds. This is um, gold dissolving in a solution of salt. All you need to make this happen is two batteries, three volts. And I've shown this to lots of chemists, and, well, they say there must be an explanation. <laughs> and I'm sure there is. <laughs> this is an instance of what I call an extension. I, I, I will s skip the long story of how I came to do this experiment, but it was from, again, following up on those very old scientific experiments. And this is my experiment, but came out of an extension of the old experiments that I was trying to um, repeat. Now, you may say that's just a peculiar scientific thing that I happen to find in the lab, but it links back to a little considered view on the general function of history. So this is the French historian Marou in his book, The Meaning of History. This is what he has to say. I will assign to history as one of its essential functions, he says, the enrichment of my internal universe by recapturing cultural valuables salvaged from the past. He says these valuables exist in the bosom of lost societies or civilizations, but to the extent that we are capable of grasping and understanding them, they again come to life in us. In a sense, they acquire a new reality and a second historical existence in the womb of the historian's thought and in the contemporary culture to which he introduces, reintroduces them. And more succinctly, Bartold Niebuhr said, he who calls what has vanished back again into being enjoys a bliss like that of creating. And this to Niebuhr and Maru was the main point of doing history, very far from usual purposes that we assign to history. This Niebuhr quotation, by the way, I got from a paper by Jim Secord. James Secord, my colleague at Cambridge, uh, who writes about a uh, very different kind of history, but uh, he, he gave this one to me. By the way, he is the head of my department, not me. So don't let it be said that I claim to be the head of the Cambridge department. And it's a very good thing that he does the job. So let me conclude. I, I've already spoken to more, longer than I planned. So having very briefly um, and in an idiosyncratic way considered the uses of history of science, I'd like to um, make several comments about some of the methodological disputes that we historians of science have had over recent decades. <clears throat> 
And the first comment is again that message of historiographical pluralism. I think I, I hope I've said enough to convince you if you weren't already convinced that there are many different uses that one can put history of science to and there will not be a single method that satisfies all of these uses. So I mean I, I hope all of these points will really come to you as common sense especially uh, having gone through what I've been speaking about in the last half hour. But that's not the main point. The, the, the common sense part is the beginning. The, the real question is, having accepted these items of common sense, how do we then put that into practice? Right. So the second point I'd like to stress is that it is crucial to engage with the content, not only the context, of the science, of the humanities, of the knowledge practice that um, we are studying the history of. Now, that's not always the case. That's not the case for all the possible uses of the history of science and humanities, but I think it is in very many cases. The third point is that I think this uh, broader way of um, looking at the history